Hey, let's hear it for our piano and trumpet prelude. That was great. Good morning and welcome to a picnic. I know it doesn't seem like a picnic. Yesterday we were giving, uh, given word that uh, from 11 till 4 there could be thunderstorms and rain. And so we decided that for the purpose at least of uh, not getting our sound equipment wet, let alone you wet, we decided to have the service portion inside. They've readjusted the schedule of predicted rain and it's not supposed to rain till about two. And so after we're done, if you wanna eat inside, there's chairs inside. If you wanna eat outside, we're gonna have some, I need some volunteers. We have more tables and more chairs and if you'll set up some more stuff outside, you can actually feel like it's a picnic, which is uh, our annual celebration of uh, turning into the month of August. We can't say how pleased we are that you've come out to be with us today. Both Abram Creek Baptist Church, the host, but uh, our sister church from Strongsville, First Baptist Church that we've been working with for over a year now, and we are kindred spirits. We are so glad that all of you have come out today. I know many of you have brought friends and family. You've invited guests to join with us. And uh, a picnic is a wonderful time to kind of introduce you to uh, our, our congregations. We really had hoped to have everything outside, but we're glad that you've chosen to be flexible with us. Speaking about being flexible, I have billed this all week as a, a service outdoor, and we're having it indoors. I've also billed it all week that you would hear Jeff Cunningham Jr. speak today, and he's a chaplain in the military. He got called out in the middle of the night for an intervention with a soldier who is having suicidal tendencies. He's doing what he needs to be doing, folks. And uh, so guess what? You get a substitute. But it's okay. God's in charge of the weather. God was in charge of, uh, of Jeff getting called out in the middle of the night. Uh, when God interrupts our plans, it means he has better plans, right? So I don't know what all of it means, but it does mean that we're here and we're excited that you're here. And again, Abram Creek Baptist Church wants to be both worshipers of Christ and witnesses for Christ because it is our firm conviction that we need, need more and more people coming to Christ in salvation and more and more people becoming like Christ um, in sanctification. So if you're, this is your first time with us, can you please feel a warm welcome to come back at another Sunday? We would, we're here every Sunday, by the way. And uh, First Baptist Church uh, of Strongsville is open every Sunday as well, and we really do mean it. We're glad that you're with us, and we want you to come back. Um, we're going to have a, a worship sequence <clears throat> by um, a kind of a combined band. And by the way, as I welcome everyone, and it is so good to have so many, but for Abram Creek, it's really kind of special for us to see some of the ones that we have loaned to Strongsville be back for a service. And it's really good to see you guys here. But we're going to have a combined band. And they're going to uh, lead us in some worship. And then uh, I do want to introduce you to uh, Sam Farlow. Unfortunately, Darlene, his wife, had to fly back to Colorado to start packing. Uh, they're the missionary family that's going to come and to assist with the rescue at, at Strongsville. So Sam's going to give a howdy do. I want to remind you, though, that Jonathan and Priscilla, who were with us last week, their display table is still out there. That, uh, that they likewise are with us today, and uh, they're going to um, uh, just be milling around with us. If the weather's good enough, we plan to have some activities. This is going to be one of those days that we just have to be as flexible as possible. So before the band, Sam is going to come. He's going to introduce himself, and uh, we are really glad that you guys are coming to be with us. God bless you. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry, my wife couldn't be here, but... Um... To be honest, we have never gone through the state of, uh, never been in the state of Ohio for any longer than just enough to drive from east to west. 
and multiple times going back and forth from the East Coast to the West Coast. So uh, about two months ago, uh, we were contacted. Actually, we were looking for a place to perhaps go and restore a church. My wife and I, Darlene, uh, Darlene Farlow and myself, are missionaries with ABWE to the USA. So uh, we've been primarily west of Colorado. We've uh, planted a couple churches in California. Then we went up to Oregon to restore a church. Then we went to Idaho to plant a church. Then we went to, back to California to restore a church. Then to Colorado to restore a church, and that's where we just finished up. So as we were uh, getting older, thinking about our grandkids, because we have 15 of them, and uh, 13 of them are split between Des Moines, Iowa, and New Hampshire. So we want to be close to both of them. So Ohio is right in between. So <laughs> we're about nine hours from each, so we can drive each way to them. And uh, as we were looking at different states in the middle of Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, that's how we came across through my regional administrator in uh, California told me about a place here in, Colorado, um, in Ohio that uh, needed some help. And so we contacted some folks. The next thing we knew, we found out about First Baptist of Strongsville. And uh, sorry, but pastor, our church is closed today. <laughs> so, but it won't happen again, all right, unless we have another combined service. And uh, we are very eager because of the help that your church is offering with these families uh, with especially we have the Cunninghams preaching and Stringers leading worship music. Uh, it's just amazing how you have uh, benefited First Baptist of Strongsville. We have been looking, um, we, we're sort of between churches because we are uh, reporting back to supporting churches. So the month of July, we had each of the four Sundays in July booked for one of our supporting churches in Michigan. Most churches these days don't have missions conferences from Monday through Wednesday or something like that. So between Monday, Sunday and Sunday, we had nothing to do. So we went to Iowa for the first week. We went to Ohio, looked for a house two weeks ago. Last weekend, or last week we were in New Hampshire, and this week we're back in Ohio because two weeks ago when we thought we were going to find a house that would be our solution to where to move, um, we put in an offer. It was verbally accepted. We were so excited. We went to the church the second Sunday of um, July and reported to them that God had done a miracle because we chose to do 31000 instead of 30000 like he had, we thought we were going to do, and, and we won the bid by $1,000. One of the things I never like to do is to give credit to God when God evidently hasn't done it because they nixed the deal. Uh, some offer came in after they had given a verbal to us, and so we lost the house. So we, that's why we're back here this week. We thought we were both going to be back packing in Colorado this week, and instead we came back this week. And yesterday we found a house that is substantial enough for us, and uh, we put an offer in on it. Um, this morning we got a, um, a realtor contacted us and said we need to go to uh, 31,000 escalation, so we're going to try and go a little higher. And um, so if God gives us that house then we'll be sure to give God all the glory for doing that. Uh, we don't want to try and force his hand. If he doesn't want us to have that house, then we don't want to have the house. But we want to be where God wants us and to meet the neighbors that God wants us to meet. So if you could pray, um, Darlene, one thing we do know, whether we have a house here or not, we do have to leave Colorado on uh, August 22nd. If this house goes through, rather than having a two-month stay where we'd have to live somewhere else because we wouldn't be able to get in, we'll have a 10-day stay. So we're excited about that. So if you would just pray that God would give us that house, we would appreciate it, and uh, we will cer cer certainly look forward to fellowshipping you in days to come. All right, he said a lot in a little time. And you think I talk fast. But that was good. Thank you, Sam. We appreciate that. And uh, we are, uh, again, praying for them as we go through the prayer needs I do want to also let you know, um, many of you have been praying for Tracy West and her family, and unfortunately, her sister Brenda did pass away on Friday of uh, complications from COVID. Her brother-in-law, David, is also in the ICU, uh, remains on life support. Um, they are making attempts to wean him off of the ventilator, but it has proven to be a very delicate process. So let's pray for Tracy, uh, already lost a sister and possibly her brother-in-law uh, at the same time. So we want to pray that the Lord would answer that. Uh, Alberta uh, 
Kate and our, our sister in the Lord has not been with us because of COVID, but she is having hip replacement surgery on August the 18th, and she wants us to start letting you know about that so that you can be in prayer. Um, Velvet is here, but uh, Jeff is traveling with Priscilla and Chris and their family. Uh, how far have they gotten thus far? All right. four-day cross-country trip with a family of, uh, of kids in a trailer that they're pulling so that they can make it to uh, Las Vegas area just outside of Las Vegas to serve our military. So we do want to pray for them. And uh, Jeff is traveling with them, helping to drive. Uh, let's also pray. Uh, we've talked about the Farlows, the house hunt. Uh, tomorrow, my wife and I leave for Kelly's Island and a week of ministry at Camp Patmos. And so if you would pray for us, we would appreciate that. And then I um, uh, also wanted to just say a, a word about yesterday's reunion. Uh, how many of you came to uh, at least part of the reunion that they had yesterday for various people in the past of uh, the Madison Avenue side of our, of our blended church? What a, what a great... Uh, reunion of, of believers, and it was great to see everyone. I do want to say a public word of thank you to Marsha Farrell for uh, heading that up. I thought that was a real blessing. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll have our worship team lead us in our singing. Our Father, we come before you today, as we always do, through the name of Jesus Christ and his finished work of atonement on the cross of Calvary. Father, thank you that as we gather today, that uh, you have promised that our Savior gathers with us, whether uh, we're outside or inside. Father, it makes no difference. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, loves the praises of his people. And we're grateful that uh, we have the opportunity to praise you today, to sing of your glory and of your grace and of your gospel. And I pray that uh, even today your gospel message would be clear as we present it to those who have assembled for worship. I thank you that we can also enjoy fellowship and food, and I thank you for those that have worked hard of getting that portion of our day to put together, and I just pray that everything would be an honor and a glory to you. I pray that you would bless us as we sing your praises in just a moment, lead the worship team as they lead us, and may we truly um, love you and adore you and worship you in the beauty of your holiness today. Dear Lord, we bring before you these folks that have requests, and I pray for Jeffrey right now as he has been called into uh, unexpected duty with uh, his chaplaincy, but we're grateful that he serves in that capacity, that he's there to meet the need of a soldier who is in despair. And I pray that you would give Jeff the words to say and the wisdom to deal with this man and the case that is before him, and I pray that even in the midst of, of his intervention, that he'll have an op open opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ with this soldier. Father, we would also pray that you would be with um, those that are grieving today. I think of Tracy West and her family and Father having already lost her sister Brenda and still with the distinct possibility that her brother-in-law David would uh, likewise not make it off of life support. Uh, Father, uh, we understand all too well that our lives are in your hand and that it is appointed unto each of us uh, uh, and 
wants to die. And so we're praying that you would uh, be pleased to spare his life and to raise him up. But if not, Father, we pray that you would help all of us to live in such a way that uh, we are ready when death comes uh, knocking on our door. Father, we would pray for uh, Jeff as he and Chris and Priscilla are driving and trying to get the family out to uh, the Air Force Base there near Las Vegas. Father, they've already had quite a trip um, getting to places very late at night and losing their reservations. Father, would you just be pleased to allow it to go smoother the remainder of the trip? We know that they're headed to Utah and then from Utah finally on to uh, Nevada. Would you just give them uh, traveling mercies and we'll thank you for that. And then, uh, Father, I, I pray for the Farlows. We're grateful that they're with us today for their ministry of church planting and restoration here in the United States. And I do pray for Darlene as she's flying back to, to pack up the house in Colorado. Pray for Sam as he's here and plans to drive the car back. Would you allow that this house hunt would be successful? And uh, we ask for your will to be done. We pray for uh, Jonathan and Priscilla. We're grateful that they're here with us today and ask your blessing upon their preparations to leave Lord willing by November for France. And we're glad that they can join with us in the fun of this day. Now, Father, uh, uh, in all of these things, our prayers are, are presented to you through Jesus Christ in his wonderful name. Amen. If you would stay with us this morning. And it is great to be back here in Abram Creek.
sinner condemned of me. How marvelous. How marvelous. How wonderful. Sing it. Sing it. How marvelous, how wonderful, when my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love. Last time. joke because there are certain songs that we could clap on and certain songs that we can't right so and I've told First Baptist several times we're good at clapping on beat you know we just got to have a leader
So remember. Remember. What a 
Let's hear it for the band. Didn't they do a great job? We're going to switch gears and look at a little bit at the scriptures for just a few minutes, and then we plan to uh, have some announcements as you head out to uh, picnic and enjoy the outdoors until it rains. All right. Take your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I mentioned that tomorrow uh, Camp Patmos ministry starts for my wife and I, and uh, uh, the theme for this summer at Camp Patmos is Journey to the Cross. So for the last three weeks, I have been working on nine different lessons. Let me turn this on, excuse me. Nine different lessons that I have to give over uh, four and a half days at uh, Camp Patmos. And so when I got the uh, message that Jeff was going to be uh, indisposed, I thought, well, Lord, this is what I've been studying. This is what they're going to get. All right. So we're going to talk to you about the cross today out of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, again, it's been a topic of, uh, of focus for me. And so um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 17, I invite you to hear God's word. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligence. Uh, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Since for in the wisdom of God, the, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand a sign, Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and a foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, Heavenly Father, help as I try to explain this text in a, a, a concise way today. We know that we have our kids with us. We know that we're dressed to go out for a picnic. We know that we're anxious to get all of the fun and festivities started. But right now, I pray that you would help us to focus for the next few minutes on what the scriptures have to teach us. Pray that you would help me, that you would bless those that are here that are, are, are not yet believers in Christ that even today would be the day of their salvation. And we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. I'm going to start with what I call the priority of the cross. Verse 17, here is the Apostle Paul, and he says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Now, it may sound funny for a guy who calls himself a Baptist, and I'm a Baptist by, by, uh, by conviction. I, 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 you know, like Dr. Jeremiah said one time, Dr. Jeremiah, what would you be if you weren't a Baptist? 
You know what he said? I'd be ashamed of myself, son. That's a joke. We know that more than Baptists are going to heaven, but here the Apostle Paul is talking about baptism, but he's saying baptism doesn't save you. In fact, no religious work, no right of, of, of any denomination, whether you call it a, a, an ordinance, whether you call it a sacrament, no religious work will save you, period, for the scriptures declare in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, 9, and 10, it is by grace that you're saved through faith, and that is not of yourself. It's the gift of God. It is not of works, lest any of us should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We are believers are supposed to do good works, but you don't get work, don't do works to get saved. You do works after you've gotten saved. And so folks, just understand that the Apostle Paul, he says, I, I didn't come to baptize. In fact, he says, I've come to preach the gospel so the cross would not be emptied of its power. In other places, Galatians 6, 14, he says, God forbid that I would boast in anything except that it would be in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is telling us that the cross has something very significant to teach us and to tell us. In fact, We've been studying the book of Romans at this church on Sunday morning, and you would all remember that Romans 5.8 tells us that, that the cross, the way in which Christ died, demonstrated something very important. Paul says it like this. He, he says, um, but God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He not only died but Philippians 2 says he even died the death of a cross. You see, cross was crucifixion. It was, it was excruciating. They had to come up with a word to describe the process of crucifixion. And the word excruciating comes as a result. It means that it was slow. It was painful. It was humiliating. It was suffering. And it tells us that God demonstrated his love for us by allowing Christ to die for us. So if we understand all of these things, and therefore, even as the Old Testament would say, that, uh, that all of our righteous works are like filthy rags. We are not saved by any work, whether it's baptism or any other kind of confirmation or, or any kind of, of, of right or, or whatever. That's how we start, all right? The, the, the text tells us the priority of the cross, and then he tells us about the power of cross. Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. You see, if salvation and forgiveness could be achieved, if it could be earned, if I could deserve it, then Christ didn't need to go to the cross. If we could do it on our own, then Christ would have never left this, left heaven and become a man and lived among us as us to die for us. If we could do it on our own, he'd have just let us try. But we couldn't do it on our own. So Christ did have to leave heaven. He did have to clothe himself with our humanity. He did become one of us to die in our place the cross. We don't want to empty it of its power. And, uh, and what power is that referring to? Well, Romans 1.16, the theme verse for the book of Romans that we've been teaching through again, says, for I'm not ashamed of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to all who believe, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, but also to the Gentile. He says that he was going to preach the gospel, not, pro, not baptize. Now, what is the gospel? Maybe you're sitting there today and you don't know what the gospel means. Well, it's a, a word that means good news. But the good news has certain key elements to it. The good news is described for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 2. 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 2. It says, by this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I've preached to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. Okay, 
Paul, you're saved by the gospel. What, what is the gospel? And then he says, for what I received, I've passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins. Let's just camp there for a second. Christ died for our sins. When he died, he did not die for his own sins, for in fact, he had no sin. He died as a criminal. He was convicted by a, 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 uh, a makeshift trial, not because he had done anything wrong, but because of the jealousy of the religious rulers who wanted to get rid of him. So Jesus died as a criminal, but he died for criminals, okay? It says, Christ died for our sins. The Bible makes it clear that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of our sin is death. So someone had to die, and Jesus died in our place. Yeah, I, I pass on to you what's of first importance. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried. Now listen, folks, the burial just proves that his death was real. He didn't swoon. He didn't faint. He didn't just pass out. No, he literally breathed his last, the scripture says, when he cried out to tell us die, it is finished. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And breathing his last, he died. He really died. So the burial proves that his death was real. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. They buried him to prove that he had a real death. And then it says in verse 4, And that he was buried and that he rose. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. You know, a lot of people die. And you can look at a lot of different Religious leaders, if you go to Mecca, you can go to the, to the tomb and actually see the coffin of Muhammad. If you go to uh, India, I think it is, you can see the, the grave of Buddha. If you go to Russia, you can see uh, their leader, uh, Lenin. You can go all around the world and see famous graves. But if you go to Jerusalem, if you go to that garden tomb outside the city gate, you know what? You're going to find that the stone is rolled away and there's a sign on the door quoting scripture that says, he is not here, he is risen, just like he said. Ours is the only religious leader that proved that he was who he said he was by raising from the dead. Remember Romans 1 says that he was proved to be the very son of God with power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ proved his claims. Because not only did he die and was in the grave for parts of three days and three nights, but he came out of the grave victorious over sin and Satan, over death, hell and the grave. Christ. This is why we're inside. We heard thunder. For those that are listening online, uh, the thunder just started to come. And so hopefully the burgers won't all get wet. Well... We'll pray that the Lord gets um, the burgers done first, all right? But before you get the burgers, i got to get done with the message, all right? I promise it's not going to be long. Christ died, was buried, he rose again. And then it says, and then he appeared. And that it's just, if, if he had to be buried to prove that he had a real death, he needed to appear to people to prove that he had a real resurrection. And he did appear to people. And that is the crux of the gospel message. Now, so that the cross would not be emptied of its power. We don't want the cross to be emptied of its power, which means that if we could earn salvation by ourselves, Christ didn't have to come. He didn't have to die. But he did come. He did die, which proved we could not do it on our own. But not only is that the power of salvation to everyone who believes, that gospel message, his death, burial, and resurrection. But get this, it proved that his power to save is greater than the power of the devil to condemn you to death. The, the Bible says it like this in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Since the children, he's talking about the Hebrew children, it's, it's in the book of Hebrews that's written to the Jews. It says, but since the children have flesh and blood, he, that being Jesus Christ, too, shared in our humanity so that by his death, now get this, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and to free us who all of our lives were held in slavery by our fear of death. 
When we say that we don't want to empty the cross of its power, we're not only saying that the power of, of, of salvation lies in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but we're saying that that power is greater than the power of Satan who wants you to die. Now, the wages of sin is death. We are all going to die. It's appointed unto man wants to die. But if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, death becomes a doorway to heaven. You leave earth and you enter eternity. Death becomes getting rid of the body of sin and you're promoted to glory. But if you don't know Christ, death is your final doom. In fact, the Bible calls that not only physical death, but the second death, eternal death. Satan holds the power of death. Christ, because he died, holds the power of life. Revelation 1 John sees that vision of Jesus while he was on the island of Patmos. And what was Jesus holding? He says, behold, I hold the keys of death and Hades. Who holds the keys, folks? Listen, Peter is not the one with the keys trying, going to determine whether or not you get into heaven. That's not. How many of you have heard that? That Peter's the one that holds the keys? Sorry, uh, wrong answer. Jesus holds the keys. We don't want to empty the cross of its power. So we, we start with the priority of the cross. Paul says, I didn't come to baptize. I came to preach about the, the, the message, the cross. And then we, we, we move from that off of the, the, that to the power of the cross. The power of the cross is that Christ died so that we might live. And then he talks about his commitment to preaching the cross. Verse 18, he calls it the message of the cross. He says in verse 23 that, it is, that we preach Christ crucified. Now listen, folks, it is a strange message. He says that to the world, this message seems like foolishness. In the Greek, that actually comes from the word that leads us to our word, moron. A moronic idea. How could someone who dies give me life? I don't understand it. Well, let me explain it best I can. Here's Jesus. He's dying on the cross. Go back to Calvary if you've heard or seen the story portrayed. And you got Christ on the middle cross. And he's got two thieves on one side and the other, right? Remember it says that they were mocking him and saying, yeah, if you're the Christ, get yourself down. But it at some point during that six-hour event, one of, the cross, oh, one of those thieves had a change of heart. And one thief is still mocking him. And the other thief says, don't you fear God, seeing we are all under the same condemnation of death today. We're all going to die today. Do you get it? And right now you're still mocking God. Isn't now the time we ought to think about what we ought to do? And so he turns and he says to Jesus, now get this, he's just admitted that they're all dying. In fact, he says, we're dying for our own crimes, but this man has done nothing wrong. So he turns to Jesus and he says something that would seem absolutely ridiculous, absolutely moronic, absolutely stupid. Lord, would you remember me when you go into your kingdom? Wait a second. You just told the other thief that we're all going to die today. And you're asking the guy in the middle cross, remember me in the future? Oh, but get this. The man in the middle cross, he was going to die that day, but he was going to raise three days later. And the man on the other cross, looking at the man in the middle cross, had to believe that that guy was going to raise from the dead so he could ask him, would you remember me in the future? Now that may seem stupid, but because of that statement, Jesus looked at that man and said, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. How could Jesus offer a criminal a social deviant. How could he offer someone 
who had violated God's law and man's law and who was justly being executed for his crimes. How could he offer that man salvation? Did that man have a chance to go to church? Absolutely not. Did he have a chance to turn over a new leaf? No. Did he have a chance to be baptized? No. Did he have a chance to have anybody do anything for him? No. He had no priest. He had nothing like that, but he had a savior. Because he had confessed with his mouth that Jesus was the Lord. Lord, would you remember me? He had to have believed in his heart that God was going to raise him from the dead because he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And see, the scripture says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is the Lord and we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So he says, Lord, remember me. And he was saved, gloriously transformed that moment. Because Jesus said, you'll be with me in paradise this very day. Folks, do you understand the preaching of the cross? It may seem like foolishness to the world that we would preach a crucified Savior. But when we understand that he died, because all of us were dead. Now, here's, here, here's the truth, okay? Listen, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14 says, for the love of Christ constrains us, or it compels us, it convicts us. We, we understand. For the love of Christ compels us, for we, for we would thus judge that if all, or, or excuse me, for we thus judge that if, if Christ died for all, then all of us must have been dead. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. And when Christ died, he took that penalty. He took that punishment. He paid the price so that by his death, by dying for us all, that those of us who live would no longer live for ourselves, but to live for the one who died for us and raised again. Well, my time is up. It really is. But I'm going to go with one more thing that we find out of that text. He talks about those who are perishing and he contrasts that with those who are being saved. For those who are perishing, the preaching of the cross is foolishness. But for those who believe, the cross is our assurance that God has paid the price for our sin in Jesus Christ and that all we must do is ask. Simply ask. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And if you simply ask the Lord to save you, he has promised that he will save you. I'd like to remind you that the scripture does say that the world is perishing. Probably the most famous verse in all of the Bible is John 3.16, where Jesus himself says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might get saved. God doesn't want you to perish. Again, if he wanted you to perish, he didn't have to do anything. He didn't have to send his son but the fact that he did send his son shows that he loves us. It shows that he wants us not to perish. So Christ died in our place. I'm going to end with what I'm going to end camp with because there's one more text. And it says, when you were dead, Colossians 2.13, in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us of all of our sins, having canceled the charge of legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to his cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Real quick. It says that when we were in our sins, Christ was able to cancel our legal indebtedness. The Greek is pretty specific there that what it is was it was the legal charges 
and I've done it for myself here. It says, James Bate, guilty of sin, worthy of death. Because of my sin, I deserve to die. I'm guilty. I'm guilty of sin. I have violated a holy God. Because I violated a holy God, it, 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 the wages of sin is death. It, it, it deserves execution. But it says that Christ wants to forgive me. So he takes this legal indebtedness and he nails it to his cross. Now, I, I decided for broadcast sake, actually, not to take a nail and to walk up into the baptistry and nail it up to the cross. But what happened when Christ died on his cross, folks? What happened? He bled and he died. So I've got, this is not real blood. Don't worry about it. It's a red marker. But we're going to take some red marker to represent the blood of Jesus Christ. And the blood of Jesus Christ, because my death sentence was nailed to the cross, the blood of Jesus Christ is on my death sentence so that when God looks, he says, Yes, James Bate is guilty of sin. Yes, he is worthy of death. But somebody died in his place. Somebody's paid that debt. It was nailed to Christ's cross. His death benefits me. So that I no longer have to die a spiritual death. But that I have eternal life through Jesus Christ. If we understand, and I believe we do, says that through this, he triumphed by his cross. The cross was not a defeat. The cross was a victory. It was how we get saved. I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. My death sentence has been nailed to the cross. But the question is, have you ever trusted Jesus Christ? Have you ever nailed your death sentence to the cross? Because if you do that, then like Paul, like Pastor Bate, like so many that have gone before, you can say that I am saved. I am forgiven. I am redeemed. I am a child of God, not by any of my own works, but because of faith in what Christ worked for me. Would you accept Jesus Christ today? We're going to pray and we're going to let you be dismissed, and we are going to go down to the uh, gymnasium and have food. Although I will tell you, hold off for a second, because I do have some announcements when we're done. All right? But I want you to know that the same way that the thief accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior, by confessing with his mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believing in his heart that God would raise him from the dead, we can do the same thing. You can ask Jesus to be your Savior today simply by saying, I believe that you are the Lord Jesus and that you died, was buried, and rose again for my sins, and I want you to be my Savior. Would you accept Jesus Christ today? Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the chance that we have to preach the gospel. Paul said he did not want the cross to be emptied of its power, which means that we cannot save ourselves but the only power of salvation is the power that Christ had to defeat sin and Satan, to destroy the one who had the power of death by his own death, to, to give us the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes, whether it be Jew or it be Gentile. Oh, that we would believe in our heart today. With heads bowed and eyes closed, is there anyone quickly that would say, you know what, pastor, I, I understand. I'd like to be saved. I'd like to accept Jesus as my savior. Anyone at all? Now, Heavenly Father, bless the remainder of this day and all of our fun and food and festivities. Thank you for all who've come out. And we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Okay.